Oh, let's start. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And this May, we're particularly excited because all month long, we are celebrating biodiversity from the biggest animals to the very smallest. Uh, and so thank you guys for joining us as part of this, uh, this fun month. Right now, we've got five classes joining us from across North America. We're expecting two more. So I'm gonna give you guys a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We've got Miss Imer's grade eight in Toronto, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hey, hi. hi. Hey. We've got Miss Galeria's grade sixes in Brampton, Ontario. Hi. hi. We've got Miss Fuller's five sixes continuing the trend in Kitchener, in Ontario. Hi. One kid was like super excited there. I love it. We've got Miss Reeves' grade three fours in Leamington, Ontario. And their mic isn't working, but they're there and they're excited and they are uh, Miss Clark's grade fives in Potter Valley, California. So welcome in guys. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Toronto by Rachel Giles. She is an aquatic ecology and pollution researcher at the Rockman Lab at the University of Toronto. And she's interested in how cities and particularly the pollution they create affect the animals and organisms and ecosystems in rivers and streams and other bodies of water. So without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel, and take it away. We're looking very forward to this. Hi, everybody. Um, so just bear with me. I'm going to change so you can see my presentation. Um, just give me one second. Dun, 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 dun. We see Jesse and now. Awesome. And there it is. Perfect. Okay, so I want to say hi to everybody and thank you for joining me today on Friday at the end of your week. As Jesse said, my name's Rachel Giles and I am a researcher at the University of Toronto and I'm really excited to talk to you guys about the hidden gems of the stream, which are aquatic invertebrates. And so when we talk about biodiversity, we often talk about these big creatures, creatures that we see, things like whales and fish, um, but aquatic invertebrates, I'm hopefully going to convince you by the end of today that they're super cool and they can tell us a lot about how environments respond to pollution. So before I share with you about my research, I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself. So this is a photo of me here doing my research in the top left corner. Um, and I'm from Toronto and I'm currently doing my work in Toronto. So there's a little photo there in the top right of the screen. There's a lot of you actually from Ontario, but some from the other end of North America in California. And in all of those places, we have water. A little bit more in Ontario than in California, but um, that's one thing that we all share. I have done a lot of work on biodiversity and I've been lucky to study different types of animals. And so you can see the animals that I've studied on the bottom left. So I've looked at plants, I've studied fish and I've studied zooplankton, which are kind of like the flies of water ecosystems. And right now I'm doing my work on invertebrates, which is the picture right beside the plant here. When I'm not in the lab or doing my research, uh, I like to do lots of other things. So the bottom corner photo is me in Peru. I'm hiking in the mountains. That was about two years ago. And I also have a twin sister uh, that you can see in the photo here. We're doing a bike trip together. I have my email included here, so if you have any questions that you're, I'm not able to answer during today's Hangout, feel free to email me. I will have this at the end of the presentation as well, uh, as well as my Twitter handle there. So if you are on Twitter, feel free to follow me to hear about my latest news. So I am an ecotoxicologist. And a lot of you probably don't know what that means, but we can split ecotoxicologist into three different words or sub smaller bits of words. So the first is eco, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with. This is related to the word ecology, which means the study of animals and plants and how they relate to each other, as well as the environment. So we study things like temperature and water, but we also study how animals interact with each other. That might be fish interacting with the things that they eat, or it might be fish interacting with other fish, or it might be fish interacting with the temperature of the environment. Toxic is a word that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So a substance or something that is toxic is something that's not good for living things. Living things include people as well as animals and plants. And ologist comes from the word ology, which means the study of. So 
An ecotoxicologist is someone who studies toxic things and how they affect plants, animals, and the environment as a whole. So before we get into the talk, I want you to think about what you think of when you think of science. What images come to mind? What sorts of work comes to mind? What kinds of people and what kind of jobs come to mind? And when I was younger, when I thought of science, I thought of this. I thought of test tubes. I thought of a white coat. I thought of working in a lab in a basement, concocting weird things and doing experiments. And that is very much science. There's a lot of science that happens in the lab and a lot of science that I do in the lab as well. But the exciting part of my research is that the outdoors is my laboratory. So I get to go outside and study the world around me, things that I see in my everyday life. And I get to study things that excite me and excite other people that things that other people can see as well. So here are some photos of the various work that I've done and the various labs that I've been a part of. And one thing that I'm ex really excited about is this photo in the bright green photo. So I'm going to be going to Vietnam next week to do some more research. And we're going to be studying litter and how it affects the mangroves in Vietnam. So if you like being outdoors and you like traveling, maybe you want to consider being an ecotoxicologist. So today we're going to be talking about pollution and how it affects the environment. And we can use macroinvertebrates to see how the environment is being affected by pollution. And there's lots of different types of pollution. So some common ones are plastic pollution, which we're learning more and more about. There's also pollution that comes from factories and industries. So those smokestacks are a common image when you think of pollution. And there's also quite a bit of pollution that's related to agriculture or farming. So things like pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and stuff like that. And as an ecotoxicologist, we look at the animals that exist in the environment and live in the environment to see how they're affected by pollution. So the questions that we're going to be talking about today and the questions that I study in my research is how do cars and the pollution that they create affect wildlife in cities? And we can break down this question into three smaller questions. So the first question is what kinds of pollution do cars make? What's actually included in that, in that pollution? Where does the pollution go? Does it stay on the road? Does it stay on the cars? Where does it end up? And lastly, how does the pollution affect the wildlife? And so this is where aquatic invertebrates come in because we use them to tell us how the environment and how the animals in the ecosystem respond to the pollution that's coming from cars. Okay, so first question, what kinds of pollution do cars make? So think about cars and think about what might come from cars. These images might come to mind. So I study these four things, which are all parts of road runoff or pollution from cars. So the first one in the top left, that is salt, which um, in Ontario, many of you would be familiar with, maybe not so much California. We use salt when it snows or when there's ice on the ground, and we use that for sidewalk safety as well as road safety. It's really important because it melts the snow and ice and prevents us from slipping or getting into car accidents. However, we use a lot more salt than we actually need to be safe on the roads and sidewalks. That second photo of that nice rainbow image, many of you might have seen before. So that happens when gas or oil leaks onto the ground and it creates a really nice image, but gasoline and oil have lots of chemicals in them that when it drips onto the roads, enters the environment and affects the animals. Cars are made of metal, and so as they age and get older, they disintegrate and the metals enter the environment. And lastly, tire dust is a kind of microplastic that's created when the car tires rub against the road, and they make these small bits of dark black rubber that enter the environment. So all four of these things make up road runoff, which is what I study for my research. So now we know what's in road runoff, we want to know where it goes. And we've seen this image before. And what you see is sort of an environment. You see mountains, you see farms, you see lakes, rivers, and cities even. And one thing that's common across all of these environments is water. So water connects many different parts of the environment, including urban areas. And because it's sort of the low point in our environment, it's often 
the dumping grounds for all of these types of pollution. So pollution from farming or roads will be on the land and when it rains or snows, everything gets washed into these freshwater bodies and eventually the ocean as well. So we know what kinds of pollution are related to cars and roads and we know where it goes, we know it ends up in the water, but now we wanna know how it affects the wildlife that live in the water. So we can do this by studying individual species like this one. So this is a baby fish or larval fish and it has been grown up in with plastics around it. And if you zoom in on the tail, you can see that little pink thing. And that pink thing is a tumor. So much the same way that if we grow up and are exposed to a lot of, say, cigarette smoke, we might grow tumors on our lungs. These fish that grow up with plastic around them grow tumors on their tails. But pollution doesn't just affect animals. It also affects plants. So if you look at this picture here, we have some nice green grass and then a sidewalk and this big brown patch of, of dead grass surrounding the sidewalk. And that's not because of people walking beside the sidewalk, it's because of salt. And so when the salt is put on the sidewalk during the winter, it eventually leaks onto the sides of the sidewalk, goes into the soil, and the plants don't really like growing in that really, really salty environment. And so they don't. So you wind up with stuff like this. This is another photo of a fish that has grown up with plastic. And what you see underneath it is, imagine you cut the fish into a slice and you put that slice on a microscope and you looked at it. So these are the cells of the fish. And rather than focusing on all those little dots, just look at the difference between A and B. So the fish that is in A was grown without plastics and the fish that was grown in B was grown with plastics. And you can see there's a very big difference in the type of cells that are growing in the fish without plastic and the fish with plastic. So we know that these individual species are being affected by individual components of road runoff or the pollution from cars. So what we wanna know now is how do you, ecosystems as a whole or groups of species react to different types of pollution, including road runoff. So we want to see how road runoff affects invertebrates as a whole instead of just one species. And before we talk about invertebrates, I just want to show you where in the environment they sort of exist. So this is a picture of um, a food web in an ocean. And so it's very similar in freshwater except for that we don't have seals, whales, cephalopods, or jellyfish. And instead of seabirds, they're probably more like regular birds. But everything else that exists in a food web is still there. So we have plants or seaweeds, we have invertebrates. Invertebrates are eaten by things like fish, and there are also turtles that eat the fish, and birds that might eat the fish as well. And so we have lots of animals that are connected. Invertebrates are th things at the bottom here, so they live at the bottom of the lake, ocean, or river, and they live either attached to rocks or they burrow down into the sediment and sort of hide themselves from the open water and other animals. These are some photos of invertebrates that I find in my samples here in Toronto. So there are some familiar species that you might recognize, like snails, and crayfish, which are like mini lobsters. And also in my hand, I have a freshwater mussel. So most mussels that we eat come from oceans, but mussels also grow in freshwater ecosystems as well. There's, as well as some familiar species, there's a lot of other species that you might not recognize that look pretty similar. They're all kind of worm-like, but there's lots and lots of different species of aquatic invertebrates. And so because there's so much diversity, we can see based on the level of bi biodiversity, how healthy an ecosystem is and how that pollution is affecting the biodiversity of that particular place. So how do we collect invertebrates? Well, first we have to drive to a place near a river. So this is actually a picture of me and my field crew in Brampton. Shout out to the class in Brampton. We put on all of our gear, our waders, our boots. We take our backpacks of gear down to the river. Then we go into the water and we put this thing down. It's called a Hess sampler and it's kind of like a big soup pot and the bottom is open. So we clean off all of the invertebrates that are attached to the rocks and then we stir up them by to 
to sort of bring up anything that has gone down into the mud and that gets caught in a net. There's a picture of the net there. So we pull the Hess sampler out of the water and we wash all of the invertebrates down the net into the bottom. And then we open the bottom and we put it into a little jar and we take it back to the lab. Once we're back in the lab, we put our samples under the microscope and we look to count all of the individual species that are found in a particular sample. So now we know all the different species that are found in our environment. We wanna know how the road runoff is affecting them. So here's the general idea. If you have an environment that doesn't have a lot of road runoff, you'll find lots of species of different kinds in high, high numbers. So this is high in biodiversity and high in abundance and high in species richness. So there's just lots and lots of different kinds. If you then go to a place that has lots of road runoff, a lot of species aren't able to survive. And so you'll only find a few of the species that you would find compared to the environment that's really clean. And these are the species that are tolerant, meaning that they can survive in not very good conditions or places with lots of pollution. And actually, you might find lots and lots of those few numbers of species. And so it's this general idea that I'll take when I'm trying to see how invertebrates are affected by the road runoff. So you might be thinking, okay, well, I think aquatic invertebrates are cool. I also know that there's quite a bit of pollution. What can I do to help the situation? Well, there's actually a whole bunch of things that you can do. The main thing is spreading the word. And so, first of all, you could lean a, lead a cleanup. You could find a body of water close to you, whether it's a pond, a stream, a lake, a river, or the ocean, and get some members of your school or your neighborhood together and clean up the trash there. At this cleanup, you could talk about what you learned today, what you learn, what you learn in school, and brainstorm different ideas of how we can improve the level of pollution in your neighborhood. To reduce the amount of pollution that you contribute from cars, you could consider taking other routes to and from school. So maybe you can walk to school, maybe you can bike to school, or maybe you can even carpool. And one thing that I think a lot of people forget about is how much power you have as a class in school. So I would encourage you, if you feel strongly about this, to write a level write a letter to your local government to tell them about what you learned and why you think it's important that we do something about it. And last, for all of you living in Ontario who probably use salt in the winter times, consider reducing your, your salt use by shoveling or even using gravel. And I would encourage you to share what you've learned with your neighborhood and even your school. And with that, I wanna thank all of you for listening to my presentation today. I'm going to open the floor up to Jesse and I'll leave this, actually I'll put my face back on. I'll give you another second to take my email down. And we can pass on the email too. If any class doesn't get it from the slide, we can always share that with you guys if you wanna take part. We've already had one of our teachers that's here with us actually has already talked to, to Rachel about that very thing. So, mm -hmm. all right. Great guys, well we're gonna dive into questions. Uh, we have a group watching on YouTube live. If you wanna type in questions too, please do, I'll pass them on. Uh, but yeah, let's start with Ms. Imer's class and then thank you so much, uh, Rachel. And if you guys wanna kick us off with a question. You guys have any questions? Uh, maybe ask her, I don't know why she got into it or whatever you want. Okay, Chanel or um, Cheyenne? Um, how did you get into your current occupation? Yeah. Um, so this was sort of a, a long process. I, growing up, I always liked science. I always knew I liked science and I, I was always pretty good at it, but I also really liked dance and really liked the arts. And so was always not really sure if I wanted to do science or if I wanted to do art. When I went to university, I decided to study science again because I liked it and I knew I liked it. Um, but I ended up in ecology because I had some really awesome teachers. And I could have just as easily gone into medicine if I had some really good teachers in that sort of science, but I had some really, really good teachers in ecology that got me really excited that I could do research outside and that someone could pay me to basically go outside and hang out. And so that's how I got into ecology.
biology. Um, in terms of me studying road runoff, that is something that I was interested in, mostly because of salt, um, because I live in Toronto and I see how much salt we use here on the roads. And so then it kind of grew from there based on um, the research that I was reading and learning about other people doing. So it's kind of a long process. Very cool. Rachel, now when we tested earlier, can you tell them a little bit about what you've done with dance too? Because that's actually, I think, a really interesting point to highlight that you've mm -hmm. been doing the whole. Yeah, so I, um, I'm i still working. I So I do my science, but I actually still work as a dance teacher as well. Um, I danced all throughout university and both performing and teaching. And now I'm a dance teacher in Toronto and so I work with kids teaching them dance and one thing I would love to do but don't do yet is to teach kids about science through dance so that's hopefully in the works but I still get to do two things that I love dance and science very cool it's something we just always like to highlight when people get to do both of the careers or both the things they really like and it doesn't happen very often so good for you uh, all right okay. to the Brampton class that we got the shout out Miss Galeria's class if you guys have a question come on up you guys have a question do you have a question? Okay. Have a question. You come back if you're shy. No, we're good. They're saying they came from nutrition break, so they're holding on to their lunch bags right now. Ah, perfect. Okay, well, we'll come back in a minute and see if you have one then. Miss Fuller's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. No? Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll go to Miss Reed. It doesn't, the oh. question doesn't have to be about my presentation. It could be anything about science or not about science or about anything. Okay, anything. It's very broad. I like it. Ms. Reeves' class, let's see <laughs> if you guys, you have someone there. Go right ahead. Um, what kind of gear do you need? So, um... When we go out, we wear waders. So the same waders that you would wear if you were ice fishing, they're neoprene waders that we get from a fishing store. And we wear rubber boots and then it's really warm underneath. So I usually wear um, like one and like a fleece sweater and then I wear a winter coat. And then if it's raining, I'll put a raincoat over that. And then when it's really cold, I wear a hat and also, you know those buffs that you like pull over your neck that you might wear skiing? I wear one of those as well. But we're really lucky because we basically go out into the stream and we do all of our stuff and we can't feel our hands and we can't feel our toes. And then we go to the car and we warm up. And sometimes we use those, um, you know those hand and toe warmers that you use when you're skiing? Sometimes we use two. Well, uh, science in Canada has its own special requirements sometimes, I'm sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Miss Clark class, I know you guys can't say in any questions, but you can type them in. So if you guys want to type in any questions, please do. While we're waiting, before we go around to the, our next class, just a, a quick follow-up. So you mentioned that there's streams you go to in Brampton. Now, does every community have streams and rivers? Like, if you went to places all over, wherever the class might be, could you find these sort of invertebrates anywhere? Um, yeah, pretty much. If you're at a stream or lake or a pond, you would find invertebrates. So that's one thing that's really cool that I've been talking, I'm going to be talking to Ms. Hoffman about is we could literally go to a stream, pick up a rock, put it in a bucket, clean it off, and there would be invertebrates there. So that's one of the reasons that I study them is because they're everywhere and you can get them really easily and they're really cool to look at as well. Awesome. All right. Well, speaking of Ms. Hoffman, uh, if you guys want to ask a question, come on up. Does, does the uh, water color change because of pollution? Yeah, actually, that's a really great question. So when we do our sampling, we start um, outside of the city and we slowly drive into the city and we sample along the river. And you can really easily see how the color of the river changes. So when you get into the city, the water is a lot more murky. It's called turbid is the sort of science word for it. And actually, Recently, we went out, there was some construction happening, and I think they were burning things, and the water was actually black, so it had like a, almost like charcoal in it. So yeah, you can see visibly just with the naked eye that the color of the river is changing. Perfect. Uh, not good, but but great answer. Uh, Miss Clark's class typed in, uh, how many labs are there for your job? Where can you become an ecotoxicologist in Canada, the U.S., or anywhere? Oh my goodness. <laughs> 
there are lots of labs all over the world um, that are ecotoxicology labs. So the lab that I'm in, the Rockman lab, a lot of what we study is plastic pollution. And so I would say there's uh, maybe a hand, five, 10 plastic pollution labs in the world. Um, when it comes to ecotoxicology, there's a lot more. So lots of labs and lots of different things that you can study. So if we study um, aquatic ecosystems, but some people study the air, so toxins in the air. Some people study toxins in plants. Um, so there's lots, too many for me to count. <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right, let's go back up to Ms. Eimer's class. If you guys have a second question. You guys have a second question? Yeah, yeah. Ask Ms. Um, what's your favorite part about being an ecotoxicologist? Mm. Um, so my favorite thing about my job is I get to work outside. So even when it's the winter and I'm wearing like six layers and I kill my fingers and I can't feel my toes, I'm just happy that I get to be outside in the water and not at a computer sitting at my desk. So definitely for me, it's that I get to go outside. Uh, another great thing that I love about my job is that I get to work with really awesome people. So we get to study really interesting questions and really important things and all of the people that I work with are really passionate about what they do and they're really excited about what they do and also really cooperative and helpful. Outstanding. It's actually something we get in a lot of sessions is that people work with each other in a wide array of disciplines that science is not something that one genius does alone. It's something that's really collaborative. So I'm glad that, mm -hmm. that came up as an answer. Uh, all right, Ms. Galeria's class, if you guys have a question now, you're welcome yeah. to come up. We have a question. Let's ask you a question. Where, where will you explore next? Ooh. Oh, that's a really good question. So that's something I've been thinking about. Um, one thing that I'd like to explore is how road runoff is different in different places. So in Ontario and in cold places, we have this sort of mixture of things that contribute to road runoff. But I wonder how it would be different in a place, say, like Vietnam, that is a very different kind of um, urban center and that obviously doesn't use salt. So that's one thing that I'd like to study. And I'd also like to study different kinds of animals as well. Anything in particular? Any kinds of animals? Um, really? I, <laughs> fish, <laughs> but also I really like plants. So okay. I think plants would be cool as well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Botany is one of those things that we always try and highlight because it's so, so cool and it's hard to get teachers involved, but I, I appreciate that that's an awesome answer. Uh, Ms. Fuller's class, if you guys have a question mm -hmm. now. What's the difference between the ocean, uh, cleaning the ocean and the rivers? That's a great question. Um, so first of all, it's important to, to remember that the oceans and the rivers are connected. And so by cleaning the oceans, we're helping the rivers. And by cleaning the rivers, we're helping the oceans. Um, I mean, that's, that's sort of the most important thing. One thing that's different in terms of the pollution that is in the oceans versus in the rivers is that in the oceans, we get these big patches of garbage. So you might have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We don't get those in streams because they're not big enough. And so a lot of the pollution is at the bottom of the river in the sand where the invertebrates live or on to in the middle of the stream. Um, also, streams move a lot faster than oceans do, so stuff moves through streams a lot faster than it moves through oceans. Interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, Ms. Reeves, class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Hi, hi my name's Cameron, and uh, we are going to try and clean these two water bottles to make them clean water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're going to... We don't really know how, but we're going to try and find a way. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, one thing I can say is if you have, if there's like sand and mud and stuff like that, you can filter that out pre pretty easily with something like a mesh. But things that are chemical toxins are harder to clean out. So you might have to do something different to change the chemistry. Okay. We can, if you have, have questions that but I... Oh. 
You cut it a little during that answer, Rachel, but basically, yes, if they have any questions, we can put them in touch with you guys and figure that out. Well, a really great mesh too for that class to consider is coffee filters. So you guys get- I think we might be frozen for a sec. I'm gonna mute and unmute. They're marvelous. All right. Um, so we'll come back just a second. Miss Clark's class passed along a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're good. You, you cut it a little bit during that answer, but you're mostly good. 95% good. It's okay. Um, Miss Clark's class had a few questions actually. So just quickly, how many things, one's really short, how many things do you have in your lab? How many tools and technologies do you have when, when you go and do this work? Oh, oh that's a great go question as well. So in our lab. Oh, you're muted again, Rachel. Let's, go. now you're good, yes. Okay, we're good? Yeah, your video is gone, but your audio works now. So, um, for in my lab, we have two big pieces of equipment, which are two really fancy micro, and then we have lots of small microscopes. I think we have about 10 of them. And then we have some sort of built-in things in our lab. So we have sinks, and then we have two, they're called hoods, which we use for when we're using chemicals or if we want our environment really clean. Um, but our lab is a pretty open space. And most of the work that we do is either at the sink or at the microscope. Okay. And then the second question, Ms. Clark's class, a great answer, is what's the most interesting thing you've ever found? <laughs> no pressure. Uh, well, we've seen uh, shopping carts at the side of the river. There's two in one of the places where I do my research that are just, they're sort of buried inside of the stream. Um, and then we also found tires, paper clips, shoes, power bars, all sorts of good things. Fascinating. A little bit of uh, mm -hmm. everything, I'm sure, when you're cleaning up rivers. Actually, it's worth diving into that really, really mm -hmm. briefly. So your outreach group uh, is U of T Trash Team. Can you tell people a little bit about that and how they might be able to get involved? Yeah, so um, the U of T Trash Team is sort of a side branch of the Rockman Lab, and we do all sorts of outreach things from leading cleanups to doing presentations like this, um, as well as doing workshops and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things that you'll see us do a lot is cleanups in Toronto. <clears throat> we recently did uh, Clean Up the Dawn on May 5th, where we were all throughout the Dawn River, and we were... Uh, cleaning up the litter on the riverbanks and we were also teaching people about plastic pollution and litter and waste management as well we are on twitter and you can find us online as well if you go to the rockman lab website uh it's called the u of t trash team very cool thank you so much and i'll pass it along to teachers as well when we're done so you can check it out directly um mm -hmm. all right miss hoffman's class if you guys have a second question come on up um what keeps you motivated in studying? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so one of the main things that keeps me motivated is that I get to go outside. So um, for my research, I, I was going out to do my sampling about once a month. And so that was definitely something I could always look forward to in the winter time. One thing that's also really motivating is when you start to have data. So we collect samples and then when we go to the lab and we count them under the microscope, it's really exciting when we start to have those numbers and we're, we're able to start answering the questions that we have. And then I would say the last thing that's really motivating for me is the people that I get to work with. Like I said, everyone's really awesome and encouraging and cooperative. And so if ever I'm feeling unmotivated, I can always just hang out with some people in my lab and feel better pretty much instantly. Super cool. Great question. That's a question I've, I've hardly ever seen in like 300 of these. So way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, we're whipping through these. So let's do a whole other round, guys. We'll start with Ms. Eimer's class. If you guys have a third question, uh, come on up. Yes. Yeah. Who has a good question? Uh, okay. Stand up and say. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, like. Did you ever think you were gonna be an ecotoxicologist when you were younger? <laughs> so the short answer is no, um, and that's because I didn't know what an ecotoxicologist was when I was younger. Uh, I remember learning about. Um, 
like the individual population communities ecosystems. I remember learning sort of basics of ecology when I was in high school. Um, and I knew because I did a lot of camping as a kid that I really liked the outdoors. But when I was in high school and when I was in middle school, I always kind of thought I would go something more related to medicine and health science. Um, but I kind of just followed my interests. And so I ended up here. But yeah, no, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, guys. Uh, all right, Ms. Fuller's group. Where do you get all the money from to do all this study? <laughs> That's a good question, too. So um, I get money from a bunch of different places, but basically the university pays me to do research. And so the university gets money from different places. Um, but there's these things called funding agents agencies, which are basically, they might be related to the government or not related to the government. And they basically uh, have big pots of money that you write an application for and say like, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I want to do. And then they decide if they're going to give you the money. And then if they give you the money, you're able to do the research. So one of those big funding agencies is called NSERC. It's the national uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council. It's a mouthful. And they fund a lot of research in Canada. There's equivalent um, things in the US as well. And then there's also, um, you know, just wealthy people who want to contribute to scientific research or people who have a legacy that they want to contribute to research. And so a lot of money comes from government, but a lot of money comes from other places like National Geographic, WWF, and things like that. Excellent. And for the classes, but it's really interesting, we, we're increasingly getting questions about how science is funded in Canada, so it's worth noting for all the students. Uh, Canada's fairly low action scheme on, on a world scale, about one in every $50 we have as a government goes towards science, about 2% of our budget. Um, I just want to pass this on because it was so funny that it came in the midst of that answer. Uh, Ms. Clark's class wants to know, have you ever found gold in a river, which of course would instantly fund your research? <laughs> Any gold, precious metals? Uh, unfortunately, not. I would say um, the most in the most the thing that's worth the most that most that I found is probably a paperclip. I mean, I guess there was a power bar, but that's not very interesting. <laughs> Well, there was that guy a couple of years ago, the classes might not know this, but he traded his paperclip up one by one in trades and he ended up with a house. So if oh, you kept really? the paperclip, there's an option for you. I also uh, found, um, we found a coconut once at one of our sites. It was just an old coconut and then we ended up taking it up to the street and smashing it on the street. Um, yeah, but not worth anything. Very <laughs> mature of you too. Um, <laughs> all right, Miss Reeves class, if you guys have a third question, come on up. Um, okay. Where did you now go and adventure? Where would I want to go on an adventure? Yeah. 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 Oh. Oh, that's such a good question. So I'm going to Vietnam next week to study litter, and that is going to be in um, Hanoi, one of the major cities. Um, but I have some vacation afterwards, and I'm planning to go to the mountains. So that's in northern Vietnam. Um, so that's my next adventure. I'd also really like to go to Italy, and I'd also really like to go to the Arctic. Okay. One day, I'm sure, but Vietnam's a very exciting adventure on, on the path to all those other things. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right, we'll take one more question from Ms. Hoffman's class, and then we'll wrap up after that. So if you guys want to end us off. Have you ever found anything that grosses you out? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, yes. Both in my research and in some of the cleanups we've done uh, through the U of T trash team. So um, when we did a cleanup with the U of T trash team at the Don River, it's right where the Don River comes into Lake Ontario. Um, we found a lot, uh, we found some needles. We found a lot of soccer balls. And um, we found this little package. I think we actually wrote a blog post about it. This little package, it was um, some hair that was wrapped up in paper and then taped. And there was some writing um, in a foreign language. Uh, and we took some photos of it and sort of sent it around and uh, ended up finding out that it was some sort of ritual that I, I'm not, I can't remember which of which like cult cultural group it was, but it was some ritual um, that they do and they sort of release it into the river 
in that same day, we also found a dead bird. Ah, so, you know, a, some really cool things and some really gross things, um, but all super fun. And on that perfect gross out science question, uh, <laughs> before we wrap up, uh, is there any last message you want to share with classes, anything that they can do? You already laid this out at the end of your slide, but is there anything you want to reiterate before we, we wrap up? Uh, I would just say to get involved, have fun, and follow your interests. Outstanding. Well, thank you so, so much for a lovely presentation. So, boys and girls, what we do at the end of every Hangout, I'm going to demute everyone's microphone, and if you guys could join me in saying a huge thank you to Rachel. Everyone is now demuted. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you so, so much for all the I'm very excited. I can't even stop them. Thank you, guys, everyone. everyone. Really enthusiastic. Great questions, everyone. Uh, Rachel, that was marvelous. Thanks so much.